Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 33, Exodus chapter 33, uh, and I am so excited to be with you this morning. One of the things, one of the many things that I learned during church shutdown uh, from COVID, those three months, two and a half months, whatever, uh, I, I realized that there would be sometimes I would take the meeting of the church for granted, and so I am trying to not do that uh, anymore, and so don't take this for granted, this time. Don't take this time of being together, the body of Christ, uh, worshiping the Lord uh, as, a, as a whole church, local church body, congregationally, and sitting under the preaching of God's word. What a special time we're, we're in right now, this, this hour. Um, what a special time. Let us not take this time for granted. Uh, we're in the seventh week of our series, walking through the second half of the book of Exodus, and just to maybe catch you up if you weren't here last week, or uh, there's been six, seven days since last Sunday, so uh, it could have stopped since then, could have forgot. Last week, uh, we walked through Exodus chapter 32, and we saw the calamity of the Israelites falling into forgetfulness at the base of Mount Sinai, and Moses and the Lord were up on the mountain for about 40 days, and during that time, the Israelites fell into forgetfulness about what God had done for them, who he was, and they fall into explicit idol worship. Um, and so Moses and the Lord come down from the mountain. They judge the people. About 3,000 male Israelites die, and um, we're now in chapter 33. And so this is right on the heels of that calamity, that horrible situation that has happened, and now it's time to move on, and we're going to see kind of the aftermath of God's response to the people and then the people's response to God from that horrible situation that took place in Exodus chapter 32. So hopefully you're there by now in Exodus chapter 33, and I invite you to follow along or listen along as I read out loud, and we're going to read the first 17 verses, so Lord willing, hopefully a little, little shorter than last week, amen? So we're in Exodus chapter 33, verse 1, and the Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, all the ites. Verse 3, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way. For you are a stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. And no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people, you are a stiff-necked people. For if a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. And when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak to Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his own tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And when Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me, Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence, this is God talking, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, Moses talking to the Lord, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. 
For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? It is not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth. Verse 17. And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Let's pray. Lord, your word is more desired than gold, much more fine gold. Keep us away from sin and falling into temptation. Be with us now as we study your word. Help us to pay attention and listen and see what you might have for us this morning from this text about how your presence makes all the difference in our lives. Help us to leave this place, Father, changed, encouraged, convicted, and challenged to live better, sanctified, distinct lives for you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, in his novel, The Hobbit, everyone look to your neighbor and say, The Hobbit. Do you wake up this morning think, you know, I'm gonna go to church and we're gonna say the word The Hobbit together as a church. The Hobbit, written by J.R.R. Tolkien. I haven't read the book. I have seen the movie. Maybe you're in that camp as well. I'm more of a movie watcher, not a book reader. I don't know, maybe you're that too. I like to read the the movies. I like to watch the movies rather than read the book. So J.R.R. Tolkien tells how Bilbo Baggins and a dozen dwarves traveled to the Lonely Mountain, defeated the terrible dragon. If I remember correctly, his name was Smog. And returned home with great treasures and their companions for the first part of the journey together was Gandalf the Grey. Everybody know Gandalf the Grey? Pointy hat, staff, long beard, uh, really friendly guy, kind of mysterious, very wise. He was their guide for the first half of the journey. And in many parts, he was also their savior. He, he was their guide. He, he, he gave them wisdom, direction, and he saved them from falling into dis- dismay and, and the whole journey being ruined. But Gandalf now could not always be with them. Midway through their journey, as they're traveling and they're preparing to enter the forest of Mirkwood, they unexpectedly learned that Gandalf would not be going with them. And this unhappy news was greeted with instant dismay. Let me quote from the book for just a second. The dwarves groaned and looked most distressed, and Bilbo wept. They began to think Gandalf was going to come all the way and would always be with them to help them out of difficulties, and they begged him not to leave. They offered him dragon gold and silver and jewels, but he wouldn't change his mind. Friends, when traveling through dangerous and unfamiliar territory, it is good to have a guide, and it's devastating to lose one. This morning, I have four sections for us to walk through in Exodus chapter 33 together, sharing with us and telling us how God's presence makes all the difference in our life. And the first point is this, number one, God cancels his trip. God cancels his trip, verses one through three. So far, so good, right? After everything the Israelites had done, after all the the sin that they had taken part of at the foot of Mount Sinai, breaking the blood covenant with God, building an idol to worship. And remember the the passage in Exodus 3-2, they rose up to eat, drink, and to play. They broke at least three of the Ten Commandments, which they had just gotten 12 chapters earlier. After that whole calamity and horrible situation, God is still going to make good on his promise to lead the Israelites to the promised land. And with Moses as their leader, they would finally leave this wilderness and enter into the land, which verse chapter 33 describes, flowing with milk and honey, a prized land, a precious land, a land that a lot of other nations wanted and even possessed at the time. But the Lord says, I'm going to send an angel to lead you, and I'm going to clear the land of any enemies and difficulties and dangers and you're still going to receive the blessings of that promised land which I promised your father Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. There was just one problem. The Israelites were going to go to the promised land but God would not be going with them. It says, but I will not go up among you lest I consume you on the way for you are a stiff-necked people. Look to your neighbor and say stiff-necked. 
Anybody wake up this morning and feel a little stiff-necked? I might be in that camp this morning. Now, this verse doesn't mean that God can't control his temper, like God's a hothead and can't keep his cool. As we've seen in the book of Exodus, the Bible likes to refer and describe God in human terms that, that we would understand. But when God decides to rain down judgment on a person or a group of people, it's not because he's lost his temper or lost his cool or can't control himself. It's because God is a righteous God And the Israelites are a sinful people. And a righteous God can't have fellowship with sin. God is holy, and it made him dangerous to stay with the Israelites, and it would be safer if God didn't go at all. And the problem, of course, is Israel's sin, and the Israelites were covenant lawbreakers, or as God so aptly describes them as stiff-necked. We saw that last week, and it will become a common phrase uh, used of the Israelites, stiff-necked, meaning they're like an animal, a stubborn animal who refuses to lower its head in submission or obedience to its master. So are the Israelites stubborn, and they refuse to lower their head in submission and wear the yoke of obedience to the Lord. God would not be going with them. This was for their own protection because at any moment he might have to judge them for their sin and they would perish. In verse 1, God refers to the Israelites as the people instead of previously referenced as my people. In verse 2, he says he's going to send an an angel. Formerly, God's been referring to this angel as my angel and some theologians and scholars, men way smarter and wiser than I'll ever be, think that God might be referring to when he says my angel as the second person of the Trinity, meaning Jesus Christ. And that is also called a Christophany, a appearance of Christ in the Old Testament, how Jesus himself might actually have led the people of Israel to the promised land, but now God's just going to send any old angel of any rank and file. And then in verse 3, God drops the bomb. Now he's not going with them. And among other things, he says that the plans for the tabernacle, they're on hold. They're on pause. And the purpose of the tabernacle was to create a sacred spot where God would dwell in the middle of the camp, in their midst, and literally in their midst. And this is the same language used back in Exodus chapter 25, when God tells Moses to build the tabernacle, it says this, let them make a sanctuary that I might dwell in their midst. And so when God says, I will not go up among you, he is literally specifically meaning and saying that there will be no tabernacle in the center of the camp, symbolizing God's presence and blessing with and on the people. And we see this irony of idolatry. The people wanted more of God just on their own terms. And that's why they built the golden calf, but now they're getting less of God because of their sin. Idolatry is always the pursuit of short-term gain with the assurance of long-term loss. And this is what happens when we worship other gods, when we chase after other pursuits, when we love things more than God, instead of leading us closer to God, those things, idolatry, leads us farther away from God and hurts our relationship with him. Martin Luther said this, whatever man loves, that is his God, for he carries it in his heart, he goes about it with it night and day, he sleeps and wakes with it, be it what it may, wealth, pleasure, or renown. What preoccupies your thoughts today? What fills your heart? God wants to fill our lives with his presence, but when we carry other things around with us, pursuing them night and day, thinking about them all the time, we leave no room for God. And the Israelites are facing a life and existence without the presence of God. There would be no divine presence in the camp. There'd be no tabernacle, no altar for sacrifice, no laven for cleaning, no lampstand for light, no table for bread, no incense for prayer, no ark for atonement, no glory for Israel. And the Israelites would have to go at it alone. They were still booked for the promised land, but God had canceled his reservations. And the previous 31 chapters are being undone. This is no mere setback. This is huge. It means the end of the road for the Israelites. It's not some slap on the wrist, oh, our bad, let's keep going. No, 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 this is big time. It means the end of the road for the Israelites. And that brings us to our second section, number two, the people's response, verses four through six. How would you have responded to the news that God wasn't going with you. You know, most people would probably think they'd be very upset. I don't know, though. Because if you think about it, think about what God's offering here. God is offering blessing, all the blessings, without the relationship. God's offering the benefits 
without the commitment. Pick that up. God's offering the benefits of a relationship with himself without the sacrifice, without the servanthood, without the commitment of being in a relationship with the Lord. Now, that's what most people want, isn't it? And if I can be so bold, that's American Christianity. I want all the blessings of God. I want him to to give me the bank account, the 401k, the house, the family, the toys, the boat, the weekend trips. I want him to give me health, wealth, and prosperity. But I, oh, church on the Sundays, I don't got time for that. Reading my Bible every day, man, I got other stuff to do. Taking care of sin in my life, I'll worry about that later. Leading my family, raising them up in the way of the Lord, I'm too busy. I got other things to do. People want health, wealth, prosperity. They want all the benefits of a relationship with God and the blessings that a relationship with God brings, but they don't want the commitment. They don't want the sacrifice. And even the Israelites knew better, which if I'm honest, it's kind of shocking. When I was reading this passage with my sermon glasses writing, uh, sermon writing glasses on this, this previous week, I expected the Israelites to be like, wow, that sounds great. Let's take that deal. That sounds awesome. But the Israelites even knew better. And they said, we don't want the blessings of God without the very presence of God. And word probably spread very quickly through the camp. God's not going with us. Did you hear? God's not going with us. He's he's still upset at our sin and he's not going to go with us. He's only going to send an angel instead of the angel or his angel. And they began to cry because they're sad to see God go. And they're also began to cry because they're sorry for their sin and they began to take their ornaments off. Now you might be thinking, I didn't know they had Christmas trees back in, he- in the Hebrew time, but no, that's the wrong ornaments. Ornaments referring to jewelry or accessories if you're into Barbies or your children into Barbies like my daughter is, accessories, jewelry, fine pieces of stuff and they take it off. There's a parallel passage in Genesis where Jacob at Bethel, he kind of renews the covenant with God and he tells everyone around him to take off all your jewelry and necklaces and, 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 and wristbands and ankle bracelets and earrings and, and take it off. And with all the other idols, we're going we're gonna to put them in the ground, we're going to bury them. And that's going to symbolize how we're rejecting idol worship and we only want to worship the one true God, Jehovah. And that's the same thing the Israelites are doing. God tells them to take off their ornaments But the Bible says the Israelites stripped it off as fast as they could. They were so eager to show God that they wanted to get right with him. Friends, whenever we realize that something is making us sin, we need to get rid of it right away. And we also need to be careful to never go back to that thing. And the Israelites were careful about this. Once they stripped off their jewelry, they kept it off. They went without their ornaments from that moment forward. This is a permanent change and a genuine sign of repentance, getting rid of sin once and for all. How serious are you about purging the sin in your life? Friends, if one of the obvious things, at least in the past two weeks, if not in this entire series, is that God hates sin. God hates it. He's a righteous God. He's a holy God. He's a sovereign God. And he hates sin. It's not, oh, whoopsie-daisy, you messed up. Oh, put it under the rug, it's fine, let's keep moving. No, no, God hates it. And if God hates sin, as people of the book, as church-going folk, as Christians, we should hate sin as well because that causes us to have division with God and we shouldn't want that. We should want unity with God. That's what Christ is offering, a unity with God to pay for our sins and we can have a restored relationship with him because our sin caused us to have a broken relationship with him. God hates sin. How serious are you about getting rid of the sin in your life? That's completely obvious in the last couple chapters, just get rid of it. Another thing we learn from the Israelites' ornamentation is the spiritual power of money. And we can trace the people's spiritual progress simply by looking at what they did with their gold. Now, I find this so interesting. Listen up. Earlier, they took off their gold earrings to make the golden calf using their wealth to turn away from God. Now, they're taking off the rest of their jewelry as a sign that they wanted to worship God alone. Isn't that so interesting? You can trace the people's spiritual progress by what they do with their money, what they do with their gold. They are literally and figuratively putting off their idolatry. What we do with our money and other possessions is one of the best indicators of our spiritual life. Are we spending most of our money 
on ourselves or are we growing in the grace of generosity? Are we subtly becoming more and more selfish with what we have or are we making deeper and deeper sacrifices for the kingdom at hand? Are we only giving what's left after we've spent everything we want on everything else we can possibly buy or are we giving maybe even more than we think we can spare because we're trusting the Lord to do a great and marvelous work? Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. A personal bank account or a family's budget is a spiritual echocardiogram. It measures a person's heart, the soundness of a person's heart, before God. Israel's heart's in the right place. And when they heard that God wasn't going with them, they were depressed and distressed in the right way for all the right reasons. They weren't just feeling sorry for themselves, like pouting. They were actually repenting of their sin. This was everything to them as far as they were concerned. If God was not in their midst, nothing else mattered. They didn't want to be led by any old angel. They wanted to walk with God. And their example reminds us to love God more than we love his blessings. Do you hear me? We need to love God more than we love his blessings. It's easy to love God when life's going swell, isn't it? Oh man, it's easy to love God when there's blessings pouring down on us, when the bank account's full, when the kids are doing great, when there's no issues, when your marriage is just fantastic, when you're passing every class, there's no relationships, problems, there's no drama. It's easy to love and be thankful for God when everything is going great. But maybe when the blessing stops, it gets a little harder. Do we love God more than we love his blessings? If this is true, we should want to keep God at the center of our experience the same way the Israelites wanted to keep God at the center of their camp. And that brings me to our third section, number three, the tent of meeting. The tent of meetings, verses seven through 11. At this point, people probably aren't quite sure what's going to happen. Um, People are waiting to see what would happen next. Will God go with the Israelites or will they have to go at it without him? And while they're waiting, the Bible tells us about Moses and this tent of meeting. Now a lot of scholars think that this section of scripture verses 7 through 11 is extremely out of place. I'd argue no, number one, because the Holy Spirit put this here for a reason. And secondly, I think verses 7 through 11 begins to resolve the issue between God and the Israelites because it still shows that at least one man in the camp is holy enough and acceptable enough and favorable enough to come into the presence of a holy, righteous God. Now, this tent of meeting, it's not the tabernacle from any account. It's, it's Moses' personal private tent. So think about the tent you have in the shed or in the garage that you use once or twice a year, right? Uh, and, and that is Moses' personal tent from all accounts, from what we can tell. It was far off from the rest of the camp. Why is that important? Because the Israelites as a nation were still under judgment. And so Moses was not part of that judgment. He wasn't guilty of the sin they committed at the base of the mountain, that calamity. And so he pitched his tent a far way off because they were under judgment. That's still a camp of sin. God is displeased with this stiff-necked people. And so Moses has pitched his tent a far way off from the encampment. And yet God did not entirely abandon them. Moses would leave the camp to go out to meet with God. Moses was still leading the people. So him and, and Aaron, remember Aaron? Him and Aaron and Joshua, they're they're still kind of leading the people, the day-to-day things that have to happen in the camp, the decisions and, and the governing, if you will. But when it was time for Moses to meet with God, he would leave the camp of sin and make his way out to the tent of meeting where God would meet him. And just picture this scene. As Moses makes his way to this tent of meeting, a long way off, a far way off, as the Bible tells us, the people would see that Moses is going to meet with God. Their mediator between God and themselves. And they would see Moses leaving. And, and as they would see Moses leaving, they would come to the door, the, the, the doorway of their tent, the opening, and they would worship the Lord as Moses made it. Picture that scene. They're singing, they're, they're praying, they're falling on their knees. Maybe they're laying prostrate on the ground. They're, they're worshiping the Lord as Moses makes his way to intercede for the people, to be the mediator between the people and God. Verse 11 says that God spoke with Moses face to face. Now that doesn't mean that Moses saw God's face because in verse 20 it says that no man shall see God and live, but most likely this is just the description of the intimate and direct communication that God and Moses had. 
And no person has had this type of communication with God, this intimate, close friendship relationship type with God since the Garden of Eden before the fall, where Moses, or excuse me, where Adam and Eve would walk with God in the garden. They would take walks together, like you might take a walk in the evening time after supper. They'd walk with God in the garden. Moses is having that close, intimate, personal relationship type of relationship with God, with Jehovah himself. Moses had intimate access. Moses and God, you could call, were friends. How interesting and how amazing. And they come down and they meet in this tent. Moses met God at the burning bush and God says, Moses, fall down, take your shoes off where you're standing is holy ground. Moses had to go up on top of the mountain to meet with God. And now God, in a very personal, intimate way, is coming down and meeting with Moses in all places, a tent. And when God would come down, a pillar of cloud or smoke would come down a theophany, a a physical representation of the presence of God being amongst the people, being down. And when, when they saw the cloud down, they knew that God was meeting with Moses and they were talking. And although God wouldn't meet with the people, there was still hope because God would meet with their mediator, Moses. And that brings us to our fourth and final point, Moses' intercession, verses 12 through 17. I love how Moses starts out this conversation. Look in verse 12 in your Bibles. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. I love how casual Moses is, don't you? I mean, that just tells you the type of relationship him and God have. It's intimate, it's close, it's personal. Like when you're talking to a friend, say, eh, see, this isn't adding up, or this isn't making much sense, or this needs to change. I love how just Moses just addresses God and, and Moses then proceeds to point out what seems to be an obvious discrepancy in his job title with what he's called to do and then the resources he's given to carry it out. And he's, he's still the same calling to lead the people to the promised land, but he couldn't do it on his own. He needed God to go with him. Moses didn't want any old angel. He wanted God. And before God could answer the prophet, he goes on to say that Moses wouldn't settle for anything else other than the presence of God. And now we're going to see that one of the main things we can learn from Moses is the way he points us to salvation in Christ. But, But another thing we're going to learn is that Moses sets an example for our journey in faith. As we seek to know what God has called us to do, we should pray the way Moses prays. We should ask God to go with us and to give us intimate knowledge of himself. Back in Egypt, Moses learned the hard way that he shouldn't try to do anything without God with him. Whatever we're called to do, whatever we're called to do, obeying your parents, serving the Lord in singleness, learning to be married, working a job, being a good spouse, being a good boss, being a good parent, whatever we're called to do, we need God to go with us because any other act Without him is futile. Moses used his favorable standing with God to press for some sort of guarantee that God would stay with him. Earlier, he had requested God's presence on the basis of his calling. Now he's asking for it on the basis of his acceptance by God. Look what he says. It says, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. How does one know God? How does one know God? It's not by spirit spiritual osmosis or hocus pocus or anything weird or mystical or magical or what have you. It's by asking God to show you his ways. How do you get to know someone? How do I get to know my wife? I spent time with her. I got, I got to learn her, her, her favorite restaurant, Olive Garden. It's kind of a cop-out answer in my opinion. It's not really, not really specific, Olive Garden. I got to learn her favorite type of movie, rom-coms. Anybody like rom-coms? Yeah, rom-coms. Uh, her favorite blizzard at Dairy Queen, chocolate ice cream with M&Ms. Amen? I got to learn all the things she likes, she doesn't like, her favorite flower, her favorite thing to do, how she likes to operate, how she likes to st- speak, how she thinks. I got to know her. I got to know her ways by spending time with her. And we need to do the same thing with God. No wonder so many of us are stressed out, anxiety-ridden, worked up, and not at rest. It's because we haven't gotten to know God's ways. 
Verse 14 says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. God's presence brings rest. I don't know about you, but after the six months, I feel like I need some rest. It's been a, it's been a rough go the last six months. I'm sure most of you can agree with that. It's been a rough go. God's presence brings rest, brings peace, brings calmness. Are you resting in the presence of God this morning? Do you know his ways? After God commits to being with Moses, Moses goes on to make another quest. First, he asks God to be with them. Now we ask God to be with the people. And this is huge. Look in verse 16. Don't just gloss over verse 16. Verse 16 is, is big time. Don't, look, don't, don't miss it. Look in verse 16. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? What makes the Israelites different? Is it their pedigree? No, they were just slaves. They don't have any pedigree. Is it their land? They haven't got any of it yet. Is it their king? They don't really have one. Is it their army? They don't really have any of that either. What makes the Israelites special? God's presence with the Israelites, make the Israelites distinct and different from every other people group on the face of the earth. That God was going with them, and Moses tells God that he didn't want any of the blessings or the stuff or the promises or the land without the ultimate blessing of God going with them, God's presence. God's presence makes all the difference. God's presence makes us distinct different, called out, separate. Christian, if you claim the name of Christ and you've repented from your sins and you've asked God to come into your life to save you, you should be living a distinct, set-apart, different life. And some of us aren't. We're so caught up in all the other divisive issues in our culture today, all the other secondary issues that we can argue about, rich, poor, Democrat, Republican, race, liberal, non-liberal, conservative, mask or no mask. And some of us are known for so much about what we care about, all these other secondary issues, and we're not known for being a person that rests in the presence of our Jehovah, of our God. Some of us are known for more what we put online and what we talk about at work than being a Christian. You know what God cares about? He doesn't care about all the other secondary issues. His number one thing is, are you a person who has asked my son Jesus into your life and have you repented of your sins? That's the distinctive that God cares about. Moses is telling God that nothing else matters if you're not with us. And then in verse 17, this is huge. We're going to see this in the next couple weeks. Verse 17, God agrees to be with the people because Moses had found favor in the side of the Lord. Frankly, friends, there are times in our life when we wonder how God could ever be pleased with us and we get weighted down by our own sin and we feel like failures and we don't even know how we can measure up to God's standards because sometimes we don't even measure up to our own standards for ourselves. And then we ask, how could God ever be pleased with someone like me? especially since I'm not even pleased with my own sin. I'm not even pleased with the decisions I've made. And the answer is that God is pleased with Jesus and therefore he's pleased with anyone who trusts in Jesus. The pleasure God takes in each of us is based on the pleasure he takes on his own beloved son. And this is the only basis on which God is pleased with someone. If if you want God to be pleased with you, From now until forever, ask Jesus to be your savior. Jesus is the mediator, and he does what Moses does for Israel, only more perfectly. He prays for our salvation on the basis of our own standing before God, and he asks God to accept us, not because we're acceptable, we're far from it. Our sin is like filthy rags to the Lord, but because Jesus is. Jesus says to the Father, if you're pleased with me, then save my people. And the Father is pleased with Jesus. He said it in his word. He proved it by the resurrection. 
And so he says to Jesus, I will do everything that you have asked because I'm pleased with you. I will save everyone who trusts in you. God's presence makes all the difference. Is it making the difference in your life this morning? Is it making the difference in your life this morning? And as the worship team comes, that's the question I have to ask you. Is God's presence making the difference in your life this morning? Are you so tired of being anxious and stressed and upset and depressed and you have drama with your friends or family? Some of us aren't resting in the Lord. Maybe you need to know God's ways a little more. Maybe you need to spend some more time in his book. We, we're asking all these questions. We're, we're, we're looking for all the answers to life and it's right in front of us, friends. It's in this book that God's written us and some of us don't even crack it open unless it's Sunday morning. Are you resting in the presence of God? Is God's presence making the difference in your life? Hey, ask Jesus into your life. That video of the six people who got baptized, they have. They've said, you know what? I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus is that Savior, and I need Jesus to have a perfect relationship with God. I need my sins forgiven. Are you living in the presence of God and is it making a difference in your life? Because God's presence, friends, makes all the difference. Let's pray. Thank you for this time, Father. Thank you for the worship team and their ministry of music this morning, how it's even blessed my own heart. Help us to live lives that are distinct. Help us to live lives that are set apart. Help us to live lives that are different. Not because we're special, because we're not but because your son, Jesus, is. And hopefully we've placed our trust in him and asked him to come into our life and to save us. Lord, help us to rest in your presence. Not because we want your blessings, but only because we want you. Lord, you're the only thing that matters. Help us to live lives that represent that decision. Lord, we're thankful for you this morning. We're thankful for this service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.